I'm here to talk to y'all tonight about God's righteousness. The righteousness of God that we all need in order to be in a right relationship with God. I'm going to open up in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. We come before you very needy people tonight, Lord. We need your grace just to live. I need your grace just to speak. Lord God, I pray that you will be with Macon, Georgia, that you will do a work in Macon, Georgia that only you can do, that you will claim this city, that you will claim this state, that you will claim this country for the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that your kingdom come, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It says in Romans chapter 3 that because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. You cannot work your way to God. No one can work their way to God. No one is good enough to be accepted by God on their own. And no one can work their way to God. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It says, apart from the law. We can't keep the law in order to be right with God. We can't keep the law in order to be saved. We can't keep the law in order to be good people. The law was not meant to save us. The Ten Commandments were not meant to make us good people. The Ten Commandments were meant to show us how bad we are, how little we can measure up to the standards of God, the righteousness of God. Just think about it. It says, you shall not lie, or you shall not bear false witness. How many lies have you told in your life? The point of the law is always been to show us how far short we come of the glory of God and the righteousness of God. It says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. What is the righteousness of God? The righteousness of God isn't God's purity, it isn't His holiness, it isn't His moral excellence. All of those things are good things. And we are so grateful that we have a holy God, we have a pure God, we have a morally upright God. But the righteousness of God is simply God meeting the standard. It is God meeting the requirement. It's the righteousness that comes from God and the righteousness that belongs to God. My friends, the righteousness of God is not some far off thing. It's right here. It, it can be right in the midst of us because the righteousness of God is obtainable. God has a standard that He commands everyone has to keep. God has a standard for all His creatures, all His creation, because he has a standard for himself. God has a standard for himself. And when you meet the standard, that means you, when God meets that standard, when God is that standard, that means that's his righteousness. It's like a, a scale or a balance. When the balance weighs out properly, that's called a just or a righteous balance. And the Bible says that God loves a just balance, but a false balance is an abomination. It says, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, that's the standard and the requirements that God has and that God produces, has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. God reveals His righteousness through the law and the prophets. What do the law and the prophets say? This is the prophet David. He says, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There is none righteous. Talking about people, talking about you and me. There is none righteous. That means you and I don't meet the standard. We can't meet the standard. It's 
it's impossible for us to meet the standard. And my friends, please don't believe just because this is quoting from the Psalms that it's, it's just poetry. It is poetry, but it's inspired poetry from God, and it's for a purpose. Paul teaches that all Scripture is given by inspiration, or is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped, fully furnished for every good work. This poetry is inspired and profitable poetry. And the law and the prophets say there is none righteous, not even one. We don't meet the standard. It says there is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. We do not seek for God on our own. We don't do it. You don't do it. My friends, there's none who understands how bad we really are. We don't understand how far short we fall. We don't understand how sinful we are. Just like a fish doesn't understand that it's wet. Because we live in sin. We move in sin. We breathe sin. You can't walk in the streets of Macon without smelling the marijuana smoke. You live in it. You move in it. You breathe it in. You don't understand. It says no one understands. Well, I'm here because I want to serve the Most High God and be His mouthpiece and let you know or ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes so you will know that no one understands apart from that work of the Holy Spirit. The Law and the Prophets also say all have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. They have all turned aside from God. Together they have become useless. My friends, if we don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are useless in God's sight. The only thing good we can ever do for God is come under judgment, come under condemnation, and be a showcase of His wrath, be a showcase of His judgment. Friend, I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. I want you to be useful to the Master, to the Father. I want you to be useful to the God who made you, the God who gives you breath and life and everything good. This is what the prophets also say. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. You might be thinking, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm a good person. I do good things. I help people. But just examine your speech. What comes out of your mouth? What do you talk about when you talk about God? The Most High. The Most Holy. The Most Awesome Being who does good. Who loves His creation. Who wants to do good for His creation. What are the words that come out of your mouth when you talk about God? Okay, maybe you have respect for God. But what are the words that come out of your mouth when you talk about the people God made in His own image? What are the words that come out of your mouth? That's how we know how messed up we are because we can examine our speech. It says also in Psalms, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Do you curse God? Do you curse the people God created and made in His image? It says their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. Some people, they are swift to shed blood. They're swift to go to where the trouble is, to where the violence is. They're swift to engage in it. You may be thinking, I'm not one of those people. But let me ask you this. Are you swift to support a person who votes for or supports the shedding of innocent blood by the taking of the life of the preborn? 
Are you swift to that? If you're swift to that, then you are swift to shed blood. And God hates hands that shed innocent blood. My friends, you don't have to stay in that position, in that place where it can be said, God hates your hands because you shed innocent blood. You don't have to stay in that position. It says, worst of all, the prophets and the law says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The biggest sin, one of the worst sins we can commit is to not have the proper fear of God. So many people think that God is like a big grandfather in the sky and as long as you talk nice to Him, He's going to give you what you want. My friend, that is not so. God is the all-powerful, almighty creator and sustainer of the universe. My friends... The very next breath that you breathe into your lungs comes from God. And He could take it away before you exhale it. My friends, if you don't have a proper fear of God, that is one of the worst sins a person can commit. The scripture goes on to say, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets paint us people in a pretty bad light. It goes on to say, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. God reveals His righteousness, His standard, the standard He keeps, the standard He requires. He reveals those requirements through faith in Jesus Christ, it's for all the believing, all those who believe, for there is no distinction. It requires faith. Faith is the open hand that receives the gift that God gives. Scripture says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. I've never seen God. You've never seen God. But you know what? I have experienced what God does in a person's life. I used to be out here on these streets selling drugs, chasing women. I would walk down this road and jiggle the handles on the car doors to see if I could catch you slipping. If I caught you slipping with your car unlocked, you better hope there wasn't anything in there I could take. But I encountered Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ invaded my life and took me over. And I'm telling you, my friends, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, that confident expectation, and it is the conviction of things not seen. I am convicted, even though I've not seen God, He's worked in my life, He's changed me, and He can change you the same way. And it's faith in Jesus Christ Faith in anything else will fall short of God's standard. Faith in anything else will not meet the standard, will not meet the requirement. You can be a person of very strong faith. You can be a person who's willing to let your body be beaten and torn and burned. You can starve yourself. But if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you're willing to do on account of your faith. It's going to be empty. It's going to be vain. And it says, for all the believing, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ. You have to be one of the believing. And it says, for there is no distinction. There's no distinction for the people that God came to save. There's no black, white, brown, yellow, red, tan, no male, female, man, woman, boy, or girl. There's no nationality. There's no ethnicity. There's no distinction between the people that God sent Jesus Christ to save. Why is that? It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all in that same fallen predicament. We're all where all ground is level at the foot of the cross because we're so bad. Like the law and the prophet said, 
It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That, that means that we are destitute. We lack what is necessary. We can't just meet the standard. We can't even get near the standard because we lack what is necessary. That's why there's no distinction. Then, talking about those who God came to save, who have faith in Jesus Christ, all the believing, it says, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Being justified. I want you to think of a courtroom. You think of a courtroom, you have a judge who's sitting on the bench. The judge is trying the facts of the case, the triers of the facts, and he says you're either innocent or you're guilty. The word justified means that the judge sitting on the bench, not only does he say you're not guilty, not only does he say you're innocent, because of being justified, when he says you're justified, that means he declares you've met the standard. Not just the standard of being innocent, but the standard of living like you never did anything wrong. You might be saying, wait a minute, you just said we're so bad that we all fall short of the glory of God. That's right, because God has to supply the righteousness. We don't meet the standard God meets the standard for us when we have faith in Jesus Christ. It says, being justified as a gift. It's not just freely. He doesn't just justify us freely. This word is a word that Jesus used when he quoted the psalm. Jesus said, they hated me without a cause. When, when it says that we're justified as a gift, it is without a cause. There is no cause in us for us to be justified by God. There is no cause in us, in and of ourselves, for us to receive that, that judgment from God to say, you are innocent and you are righteous. You, you have credited to your account like you never did what we know you actually did. It says, being justified as a gift by His grace. Everything I'm telling you that God does is by His grace. And grace is not just unmerited favor. Grace is not just getting something you don't deserve. Grace is that, but it's more. Grace is also getting the opposite of what you deserve. Grace is when God gives you something good rather than giving you what you deserve. What we deserve is judgment. What we deserve is condemnation. Instead of the judgment being you're not guilty, instead of the judgment being you've met the standard, our judgment should be condemnation, the death sentence. So, God's grace means He gives us the opposite of what we deserve. It says, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. This justification, being justified without any cause in us by God's grace sounds good. But what's the means? How does this take place? It says, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Redemption means a price that is paid to buy something back. My friend, if you're not in Christ tonight, you belong to sin. Sin owns you. Sin rules over you. And Jesus Christ paid a price to buy me back from sin. The only way that price was ever paid for you is if it is applied to you by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ paid a price. It says... Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. He paid that price. What was the price? It says, whom God displayed. Talking about Jesus, 
whom God the Father displayed publicly as a propitiation. God the Father displayed Jesus Christ publicly as a propitiation. A propitiation is a sacrifice. A sacrifice that appeases wrath. All through the Old Testament, the nation of the Jews, God's chosen nation, had to offer animal sacrifices, especially on the Day of Atonement, in order to try to appease the wrath of God. Those sacrifices did not appease the wrath of God, but they did please God because He was long-suffering toward that nation. Those animal sacrifices could not do what Jesus Christ would do. It says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. God the Father displayed Jesus Christ publicly as, as that sacrifice that would appease His wrath by allowing Jesus to be tried in a very wicked court in the public and condemned under men. Then He was beaten. Then... He had to drag this cross. Then he had to drag his cross to the top of a mountain. And publicly, the Lord Jesus Christ was... Publicly, the Lord Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross through his hands, through his feet, and he hung there for hours and hours on end. He hung there suffering, bleeding, in agony and pain. And this was all in public. You might be thinking, why do these men come down here in the public and do all this religious stuff? You may be thinking, we come down here in public because our Lord was crucified in the public. It says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood. When Jesus Christ was hanging on that cross, His blood did flow, but it was not just His blood that fell on the ground. It's the fact that Jesus Christ gave His life. Jesus Christ gave His life as the sacrifice, the propitiation that would appease the wrath of God. Jesus Christ died for all those who would ever believe in Him. And that's how the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, that price being paid to buy us back, that's the means by which it is accomplished. Propitiation in His blood. And it's through faith. It's propitiation in His blood through faith. My friends, Everything that I'm saying is true, it's happened, it's verifiable. These things were written down by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. This is verifiable what I'm saying, that Jesus did die on a cross. But you have to have faith that that death was for you and can and will be applied to your life. It's through faith. If you don't have faith, then what I'm saying might be just a nice story to you. It has to be through faith. It says, this, everything that I just said, this was to demonstrate His righteousness. This is how God's righteousness is observed. God's standard, the standard that fulfills all the requirements that God has for His creatures is displayed, it, it is demonstrated, it is observed through the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood 
through faith, this was to demonstrate God's righteousness because in the forbearance of God, He passed over sins previously committed. God has forbearance. He has long-suffering. He has patience. He has self-restraint. My friends, if God did not have self-restraint, you and I would not be alive right now because of how much we've sinned against a holy God. If God did not have self-restraint, I know that I would not be here because I spent the first 21 years of my life as a blasphemer, a fornicator, an idolater, a thief, a drug addict, a criminal. If God did not have self-restraint, I would not be here because I was the person that the law and the prophets were talking about. When it says, there's none righteous, there's none who understands, there's none who seeks for God, they have turned aside, there's none who does good, there's not even one, their throat is an open grave. The things that I used to say about the Almighty, Holy God, were wicked, blasphemous things. But it's because of God's forbearance, because of His self-restraint. He passed over the sins that were previously committed. God did not kill me on the spot when I blasphemed Him, when I mocked His people, when I committed all types of abominable idolatries. God didn't kill me on the spot, and He's not killing you on the spot because He has forbearance. He has self-restraint. He passed over the sins you have previously committed because Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ died for the sins of all those who would believe in Him. For the demonstration, God, self-restraint and passing over the sins previously committed was for the demonstration of His righteousness at the present time. It demonstrates God's righteousness, His standard, His meeting the standard. By letting... It says that this was a demonstration of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. My friend, God's forbearance, God's passing over the sins I know I previously committed, it was at this present time so that He would be just, so God would meet His own standard. God would meet the own requirements He set out. The requirement is the wages of sin is death. All the sins I committed when I was on these streets stealing and doing drugs and selling drugs, all those sins had to be paid for. The wages of sin is death, my friends. So, it says... Of, this, of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just and the justifier. God had to meet His own standard by making sure the sins I committed were paid for. That way, He would be just as the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. My friend, faith in Jesus is the only reason I was justified and God had to send Jesus to live a perfect life that we could not live. The Father sent the Son to live a perfect life that we could not live. And the Father let Jesus Christ be persecuted, tried, found guilty, beaten, nailed to a cross, and die so that the Father's wrath could be poured out upon the Son. Jesus Christ had to take upon Himself all the wrath of the Father to pay for all the sins of those who would ever believe in Him. My friends, God cannot simply forgive your sin. 
if God just simply forgave your sin, that would make God unjust. There are religions that say that their gods, so-called, will just forgive your sin. My friends, listen. Do you love women? That means you should hate rape. Do you love children? That means you should hate pedophilia. Do you, do you love your mama? That means you should hate the idea of somebody raping, robbing, and killing your mama. If God did not hate sin and punish sin, there would be something morally deficient in God. Do you believe in a God that can be morally deficient? If you do, you don't believe in the God of the Bible. God cannot simply forgive sin. Sin has to be paid for. Sin, the wages of sin is death, and the soul that sins, it shall die. That's God's standard. God had to meet His own standard to be just and to justify the one who has faith in Jesus. If you believe that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, and then die for your sins against God, you can be justified. You will be justified. It says, because of everything I just said about God being just and the justifier, it says, where is boasting? You can't boast in yourself if it's all God's work. You can't boast in yourself if you didn't work for it, if you didn't earn it, if you didn't do something to make it happen. You can't boast in yourself. You can boast in your works. You can boast in your law keeping. You can boast in your religion. You can boast in your knowledge. You can boast in your schooling. But you cannot boast if it's God's grace that killed Jesus. You can't boast if it's all God's work says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, boasting is excluded. I can't boast in anything except for the grace of God. I boast in the grace of God because God did all the work. I can boast in God because He did all the work. It says, Boasting is excluded by what kind of law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. If it's all God's grace and it's all faith, then there's no boasting. If you can keep the law, if you can do religious ceremonies, if you can be good enough, you can boast in that. But there's no boasting if it's all God's grace and all faith. Grace alone, faith alone. It says... For we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. A, a person is justified. That is the declaration of God that a person is forgiven and a person is righteous. That declaration comes from God the judge through faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? He's not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. The Gentiles are the nations. The nation of Israel was God's chosen nation, but the other nations, God is also their God. And God is coming for the other nations. Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ has claimed to all the other nations. It says, since indeed... The God who will justify the circumcised, that's the religious people, by faith. And the uncircumcised, that's the non-religious people, through faith is one. There's one God and He saves all of His people the same way. That's through faith in Jesus Christ. Do we then nullify or make void the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Everything I just said about God's grace saving you through faith in Jesus Christ does not nullify the law of God. It says in Romans 7, 
So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The holy, righteous, and good law is not nullified by grace and faith. It's established. You can't work to get to God, but once God comes and saves you by grace through faith, you want to work for Him. That's why we're out here. So we saw God's righteousness. We've observed God's righteousness through the sacrifice of Christ. How exactly is God's righteousness obtained? We're given at least two examples. I want to talk to you about one example, and then I'm going to finish. It says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? He gives us an example of how God's righteousness is obtained by the example of Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish race and Jewish religion. It says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. If Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish race and Jewish nation, was justified by works, he could boast. If it was because of his circumcision, if it was because he obeyed God and left his father's house and went to a land that God had to show him, that those were works. He could boast about that. But that's not how he obtained God's righteousness. He can't boast before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God's promise. God made a promise to Abraham that I'm going to make a great nation of you. I'm going to give you a specific seed. I'm going to make that specific seed as numerous as the stars in the sky. I'm going to make that seed as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Abraham believed that promise and it says it was credited to him as faith. My friends, tonight, if you believe the promise that God made that Jesus Christ can be your propitiation and accomplish your redemption and be the reason you are justified, if you believe those promises, it will be credited to your account by faith. That's just like when you work. When you work and you earn money and it's direct deposited to your account, it's credited to your account. God will credit His righteousness to your account when you believe the promises of Jesus Christ and His gospel. Our Father and our God, our Lord and our Savior, Holy Spirit, our Helper, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your truth. We thank You, Lord Jesus Christ, for coming and living a life that we could not live, a life that I didn't even want to live. We thank you, Lord, for coming to this earth and being a perfect sacrifice for our sins so we would not have to remain slaves to sin, sold under sin. We thank you, Father, for the work that you've done in our lives. We thank you for the work that you're going to do in the city of Macon, Georgia. We want to praise you. You are high and lifted up. You are holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray with thanksgiving in our hearts. Amen.